Now, uh, first I want to thank uh, Dominique for asking me to uh, give uh, a talk uh, on, uh, the, on this occasion. Now, uh, a couple of things uh, about me and colors. I am not an art historian. No. And uh, I, when uh, Dominique asked me to uh, do this presentation, I was a little bit perplexed at the very beginning. Uh, and this is what led me to choose uh, this, uh, the, the, the way in which I would look at the theme. Uh, because uh, the important thing in the, my title is not so much the title as the subtitle, which was not put in the program. But anyway, that's uh, neither near, here nor there. So colors and cognition. Uh, so what I'm, I'm going to approach the subject from a very, very different angle than uh, any, everybody else who's done so far, essentially because I want to uh, look at the way in which uh, the pigments started to be used. And I want to emphasize first the connection between uh, cognition uh, that is, uh, how we interpret and look at colors and the colors themselves. So I'm not going to deal, I'm not going to deal with, um, with uh, different um, uh, chemical analyses or anything of the sort. Just look at historically and prehistorically how things develop. And I will start with uh, examples from the modern world. Uh, where uh, essentially uh, we can actually look at different meanings for the same types of colors. So you'll have to bear with me for about uh, five minutes while I begin. So uh, we give meanings to colors, okay? Uh, and these meanings are uh, essentially uh, culturally mediated, that is, that there are different views, different ideas for colors. So in the West, for instance, uh, when we took, and I start with flowers, okay? Uh, when uh, we say, uh, I feel blue, for instance, uh, we, we think of the color blue, it brings the idea of sadness. Uh, when we think of the color white, uh, we think of the color of light, purity, and the like. And this is something that uh, goes back uh, to, uh, to, the, to very far into the past. And then if when we look at the color red, we think of uh, passion, uh, danger, uh, and things of that nature. Now I think you, uh, you know where I'm going with this uh, color scheme. Huh? Uh, because then when you put all of three together, uh, you get this. You get different you get different um, views, you get different um, 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 identities, huh? somewhat, somewhere, um, at, uh, at odds with one another. Huh? Now, I know that these, uh, these flags uh, have, uh, have, have been uh, developed out of sometimes very, very different circumstances, huh? with uh, the flag of Britain, for instance, being a combination of the flags of three nations, uh, the flag of France being the combination of the flag of Paris, to which was added a white band. The Americans, well, I think they must have imitated the Brits, and I don't know about the Russians. Huh? So you have all of this in, uh, in, in the same types of colors. And we'll come back to these colors a little bit later. Okay? Then, uh, there's the color white, uh, which uh, in the West we associate to purity and youth and light, and it's the color that uh, we see uh, on brides uh, most often, perhaps not all the time, for whatever reason. And uh, But in India, for instance, it's more red and gold. Same circumstance, very, very different color. Okay? Um, then... Uh, we have colors uh, and mourning in the West, uh, the, the black band, or even in, uh, for uh, women, very often, the entire black uh, uh, cloak um, is uh, de rigueur. In China, white is the color of mourning. In China and Japan, Korea, 
places like that. Then we have uh, colors and maybe unintended meaning. Huh? A bit uh, what we call cognitive dissonance, if you will. Uh, the Société Générale, which is a bank. And then you have this, which has exactly the same color scheme. And uh, I don't think that the Société Générale is the bank of the anarchists. I don't think so. Huh? But same colors, very different meanings. And then we have this also in uh, other types of circumstances. For instance, uh, we have this here, uh, the Mexica Four Directions. Now this is a feature that we find that archaeologists have found uh, in many instances in, uh, in Mexico. Uh, for Mexica, the, those are the Aztecs. And also uh, among the Zapotec, uh, uh, Kent Flannery, has actually excavated some of these in temples and with exactly the same uh, the same color scheme the same directions uh, and uh, they're used in divination in uh, the giving of oracles uh, so there is a sort of cosmological uh, meaning uh, to all of this and I was happy to see this morning when Aze gave her uh, talk that there was something similar with uh, the Chinese but with five different colors, okay? And then you have this here, uh, the Ojibwa medicine wheel, with exactly the same type of, uh, the same type of, uh, of a design, uh, with uh, dire the, the directions, with different colors, but uh, with uh, a association with uh, not just the, the, uh, the, the directions, but also the seasons and different types of emotions and different types of, um, of, uh, of healing uh, instances. Okay, so all of this is stuff that we can actually see uh, in the world today and we could multiply examples of the sort, but uh, this is not uh, my purpose here. My purpose here was simply to, uh, to show that different colors or the same colors in different contexts may mean something very, very different. So for me, the interesting question is, when does this all begin? Uh, and this uh, justifies uh, my uh, title, but uh, you will see very quickly that my title is, does not follow exactly uh, what uh, it actually says, what my, uh, my talk says. So when does this all begin? We, go to, uh, we have to go to Africa. And uh, we have to go to the site of Olorgesaili, which is located in southern Kenya. And uh, in, as you can see, in 2018 here was published uh, this image, which is from a, an important article in which uh, are detailed a number, in this image specifically, are detailed the uh, the presence of a number of, uh, uh, of pigments essentially it's a red ochre and red ochre is the pigment that is the most commonly used in uh, the middle stone age of uh, of africa uh, you can see uh, in on a here uh, this is where uh, the uh, pigment has been rubbed off uh, uh, and there are, uh, you have in uh, B also, you can see here, traces of the pigment that is left. So this is essentially uh, one of the first instances we have for the uh, use of pigments. Now, if we look at pigments on their own, and we look only at pigments, uh, that is, if we don't take into account the entire um, context of uh, the discovery, we might ask, what does this have to do with cognition? Now, it's not just a question of the color itself. Uh, we know that uh, physically, uh, hominines, uh, human ancestors, just like their ancestors, the apes, uh, were uh, able to see color. And uh, there are functional reasons why we can see color. But uh, at Olorgesaili and in other places in, uh, in Africa, uh, at this is around 300,000 years uh, ago 
Uh, there are other things that uh, show the way and tell us that this is part of the development, the beginnings of the development of modern human cognition. Um, 300,000 years ago uh, th is the um, earliest date, and here it says just after 320,000 years ago, is the earliest date for the discovery of uh, Homo sapiens. Uh -huh. uh, Homo sapiens at Jebel Yehud in uh, Morocco. Uh, and this is uh, the best example uh, of the collection in uh, that location. Uh, so this was published in 2017 by uh, Jean-Jacques Hublin. And uh, what we have at the same time as uh, we have the emergence of these, um, of the use of these pigments, uh, it's we have long distance exchange. Uh, there is at Alorgasali in the same levels as where the pigment have been found, uh, there is uh, abundant obsidian. Uh, and obsidian is not found at Alorgasali itself. Uh, it comes from different sources, distant 40, 50, up to 200 kilometers on either the north or the south of uh, this uh, of this site. So long distance exchange implies also development in cognition. You have to be able to uh, recognize uh, your neighbors. You have to be able to uh, to uh, um, uh, to communicate uh, with your neighbors. You have and you do not actually move 200 kilometers to find. Um, to find that type of material. In addition to that, you have the development of points, okay, uh, which are extremely, uh, from the point of view of cognition, are extremely complex uh, to make. And this is followed shortly afterwards with the earliest blades that we have. Uh, this too shows a great deal of cognitive development. Now, a great deal of this uh, is actually uh, discontinuous. And we do not have uh, all of this all the time, but what this tells us is that the Middle Stone Age, um, uh, on uh, the slide here, uh, which is from uh, Alison Brooks, uh, a talk by Alison Brooks, uh, she says that this is between 320 and 20,000 years ago. Uh, in fact, there's a mistake here. It's uh, to 50,000 years ago. This is what the Middle Stone Age is in Africa. After that, we're dealing with the, uh, uh, the later Stone Age. Okay? So, we have all of this uh, that is uh, seen in, uh, the, uh, uh, in, in the landscape, in the archaeological record. So, all of this tells us that uh, human cognition and pigments, the use of pigments, go hand in hand, okay? Now, on to Blombos Cave. Uh, Blombos Cave is, this is dated around 100,000 years ago, and uh, what was discovered there was very important uh, material. What you have here is an abalone shell, okay, with some ochre here and here, and you have powdered ochre here. So this is essentially a, uh, um, a place where ochre was processed into, into powder and uh, it uh, was used. We know that the uh, earliest examples of ochre, and we know this uh, in an indirect way, uh, was uh, used uh, to paint the body. We do not have uh, well, we do have uh, one example, but we do not have, in general, examples of objects that are painted this early, at 100,000 years ago. But we do have a number of uh, indications that um, uh, ochre was used uh, on the body. Uh, either because it is, uh, well, it was either ochre or it could have been clay also to um, cover uh, the body. It uh, is used as a sunblock in particular, uh, but has also other aesthetic views. And this can be verified ethnographically by from the people who still live today 
in, uh, in Africa. Not that there is a direct connection. Um, at 75,000 years ago, uh, one uh, decorated block of ochre at seven and a half centimeters in length. There, are, there is a second one from uh, the same location, decorated with a cross hatch pattern. And uh, the earliest uh, example of painting, which is approximately the same date as the bit of, um, um, of um, um, the, the slide that I showed uh, before. Uh, uh, this in the literature I saw was called a hashtag. It's a cross hatch pattern. Uh, I don't think they had Twitter at the time. So, moving along. And then, how do we know about uh, this ochre? Well, these pendant shells here uh, were uh, used, um, were used, well, we could call them uh, very early, um, very early jewelry. Um, they're beads. Uh, they were perforated uh, by humans. Uh, some predators uh, can do things like this, but uh, this is clearly done uh, by uh, humans. And uh, all of these are stained by uh, the uh, by ochre, because uh, this is not the natural color of these of these shells. Now, we know that in the Middle Stone Age of Africa. Uh, from uh, 100,000 and 80,000 years ago, a large number of sites uh, show these beads. And uh, how did they come to be um, uh, stained like this? It's not that uh, they were deliberately um, painted. It's more that they were, um, they were worn uh, as pendants, necklaces, or bracelets, and they picked up uh, some of the pigment that was on the skin. So this is one of these earliest uh, usages of the uh, of oops of the uh, of the material. Okay. Then uh, in seconds. This uh, gives you an idea of the range of material found at Blombos Cave. Some of the shells, the uh, ochre blocks. Uh, eggshells, um, uh, um, ostrich eggshells with different types of patterns and uh, points and uh, here also points and then stone points. Uh, there is even a slightly later on in, at uh, Border Cave uh, indication of the use of poison uh, on, uh, on projectiles. Okay, then uh, we, sh we find those beads uh, all over the place. D here is from the modern seashore. Uh, A and B are from a school, which is in uh, the Levant. And C is from uh, Wed Jabana, which is in, um, in Algeria. Okay, So this is dated around 100,000 years ago. Okay. And more from uh, northern Africa. I'm not going to comment uh, on these in any way. It's self-explanatory. And then we have a few also from Uchazla Cave in Hatay, uh, dated between 41 and 29,000 uh, BP. Uh, so this here, this now is known as the initial Upper Paleolithic. And you, you can't see much on, uh, on these, uh, although uh, this one here shows a little bit of pigment left on it, but my second slide will show exactly the same type of thing. And you have here a great deal of pigment left here and here. Okay, uh, that uh, actually this is the same the same shell here. So this is the same type of uh, phenomenon. So ochre uh, was used in life uh, on the body. Now we know also that uh, there were a lot of funerary practices that uh, develop in the Middle Stone Age. Now, this is not Middle Stone Age. Uh, and uh, we know that there is ochre in graves. Uh, we know, for instance, that there is also some form of uh, ritual that was practiced as early as 150,000 uh, years ago 
Uh, there is a cranium of a child from uh, the site of Herto, which is in Ethiopia, uh, where the cranium itself shows signs of having been polished, uh, which means that it was manipulated post-mortem. And so this points also to uh, some form uh, of ritual. Now here, before going any further on uh, these uh, graves, I want to uh, make one thing uh, clear here, uh, and I'm, uh, that I'm following the views of Colin Renfrew on the uh, question of uh, the sorry the question of um, of uh, what uh, these um, the, these practices actually mean, uh, in the sense that when we have no access, no direct or indirect access to uh, the ideas that uh, animate uh, action, uh, when we don't have any texts, when we don't have any um, um, uh, oral uh, connection with uh, the past, we have to avoid um, we have to avoid um, interpreting uh, what exactly the symbolism mean. It's clearly a symbolic uh, practice uh, uh, the, um, uh, and it's, uh, it's almost universal. Uh, we have examples, uh, this one is from Australia from 42,000 years ago. Uh, others in Australia are known 20,000 years earlier than that, at 62,000. Uh, you have ochre in graves at Capze in the Levant at, 100, at around 100,000 years ago. So uh, this is all very, very, uh, very common. It's almost universal. Now, why is it that people would put ochre in, uh, uh, in graves? Well, if we are bold, uh, we might um, argue that, uh, well, um, ochre, red ochre in particular, is the color of blood. And that blood is a uh, liquid associated to life, and that is a way of uh, emphasizing uh, life in uh, after death or something of the sort. Uh, I'm, uh, although I'm saying this here, uh, I'm going to avoid arguing in favor of this simply because we don't know. Uh, it's okay to say that we don't know about uh, some phenomena. Uh, here at uh, Mongo Lake, uh, the, uh, the uh, a ritual is uh, reconstructed. Now, we don't know if this was actually uh, how it was done, but uh, we have uh, the ochre in the grave itself. And as I mentioned, this is uh, quite uh, common. Uh, we have this quite uh, striking um, uh, example of two uh, two uh, baby girls. Um, genetic, uh, genetic studies have been made and it turns out that they're identical twins who probably died very shortly after birth and they were covered in ochre at burial. Uh, this is not blood. Uh, this is not uh, blood that stains uh, the sand around it and given that uh, the color of the sand uh, around the tomb uh, it makes a very uh, vivid uh, contrast. Okay. And then we have a drawing from the Lagarveo uh, child uh, dated to the Gravettian period, where also the body was covered in ochre. So we have two examples in Europe. We have several examples in, uh, in, um, uh, in Australia. We have examples in the Near East. And I forgot to say that we also have examples in Africa. Uh -huh. uh, by 90,000 years ago, we have ochre in graves in Africa, uh, according to, um, according to um, um, uh, Alison Brooks. So, then uh, I should talk about also the uh, cave paintings and, uh, and rock art. Uh, of course, the more spectacular uh, manifestation in the Upper Paleolithic is uh, are the cave paintings uh, uh, where uh, different types of pigments were used and this is going to be the only time when I'll, I'll mention the origins of pigments uh, uh, and uh, so we have uh, black 
we have red, uh, we have other red with a, a human hand, and we have white. So black is usually uh, considered to be charcoal. Uh, although I know that manganese uh, oxide can be this color, but it's not uh, recorded in, uh, in anything that I've read, except uh, to say that uh, Neanderthals may have used uh, um, uh, manganese oxide as pigment, although there's none in their graves though. So red, here, red or brown here, this is ochre, and this is clay uh, with which the drawings have been made. And then we have, and that, oops, sorry, I should go back. Uh, this is from, uh, all of this is from Chauvet, uh, 30,000 years ago. And then we have also, oops, no, 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 I'm supposed, ah, here we go. So I don't know why it skipped. And we have also this, which is from Lascaux. Now, when uh, people talk about the uh, material from uh, these uh, painted caves, uh, people always talk about the subjects, about the interpretation, about uh, the pigments themselves. Uh, and uh, of course, uh, it's all possible. Yabé uh, Breuil um, thought uh, in terms of um, the hunter's uh, symp sympathetic magic or hunting trophies. Le Roi Gourin thought that there was some form of sexual uh, symbolism in uh, the, um, the, the combination of uh, schematic and uh, figured representations. Others have thought in, of a system of, um, of um, in, uh, information uh, being transmitted. Now, I think that uh, when we look at these uh, paintings, one thing we have to be uh, to take also into account, which is uh, highly contextual, and this is light. Uh, we look at these images today, and uh, we marvel at the forms, we marvel at the, com uh, at the compositions, uh, well, although we are aware that uh, these, um, these were done over a long period of time, but uh, we never actually see them as they would have been seen. Uh, and I think uh, from, a, from a, a cognitive point of view, the way in which they would have seen, would have been seen is extremely important. Uh, because uh, what sort of lighting did uh, the people of the Paleolithic have? Uh, they had what, small lamps, as has been found at Lascaux, or they had uh, torches with flickering light, dancing light on the, uh, on the walls, uh, and it gives a very, very different feeling to all of, these, uh, all of these objects. So we have to take that into account. I don't know if uh, this would have been spiritual or what, but we have to be aware of this uh, type of, uh, of feature. Okay. Uh, and also, uh, the, uh, some uh, of the painters uh, used the qualities the, uh, the, um, of, of the stone itself. Uh, you see here the head of the horse uh, as a shape in the stone itself. And on the goat here, uh, you would think that uh, they had angora goats in, uh, uh, in, the, uh, in the Dordogne. Uh, this is from uh, uh, Peche de Lazé, no, Peche Mel, sorry, uh, with uh, the long hairs of the goat uh, here. And again, uh, you have to think of this in, uh, in, terms of the, um, in terms of the context and the lighting uh, which uh, would have been available for them to uh, see these. Now, I mentioned in my text, in my title, that I would uh, go all the way to, um, uh, to Silicon Valley. Well, apart from the fact that uh, the technology that we are using is often uh, associated with Silicon Valley, there are a number of features that uh, can uh, apply, and I think of this here. Uh, now, these are not the actual original pigments, and these two are from uh, Lascaux, but they were superimposed electronically uh, to um, aid in the visualization of the drawings themselves. 
Okay. Now, I think that's enough for the Paleolithic. And uh, we all, I want also to uh, talk a little bit about the uh, later periods. When we are dealing with later periods, we are somewhat in a uh, better position to try to find meaning uh, to things, uh, to uh, representations. Um, and here, what I want to uh, contrast is the difference in, uh, in, uh, in color between the skin of uh, the man here and that of uh, the woman. Okay, uh, Men represented in very dark colors, uh, represented in brown here, uh, and women in very light skin tones. Uh, why uh, is this? Well, everybody's uh, mentioned that it's a convention, that uh, it's just a way of representing things, uh, does it correspond to reality? Uh, I think that uh, it uh, does not, and it's more a, a feature of ideology and of uh, the way in which uh, the uh, position of both men and women are seen in society. Not necessarily that uh, women are seen as inferior because they're confined to the, uh, to the interior, and therefore their skin does not tan, like uh, that of the men, although we know that in some instances uh, this is uh, pretty much the case. Uh, and, and I'm thinking here of uh, more aristocratic households in the Greek world. Okay, So we have this, but then we have something different, uh, and this is from the Amarna period, and this is the throne uh, of Tutankhamun, uh, where uh, both uh, the man uh, and uh, well, so that's Tutankhamun and his wife are uh, painted in the same color, uh, uh, which is probably related to differences in uh, in ideology and a greater care for the representation of um, in um, a naturalistic representation after Tutank uh, after Akhenaten. Now moving on. Now this and this um, uh, uh, this um, uh, this custom uh, is extended elsewhere. Uh, we have it in Crete, and in this is from Santorini, from uh, Thera, where you have men in very dark colors, and it's more than one example. And you have a woman here in very light, uh, with very light skin, and she is obviously represented in the outside, uh, 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 emptying her, ba uh, her basket of uh, crocus uh, uh, flowers uh, into a bigger basket. Uh, so uh, on, in the outside, but still represented as very, very light, uh, very light, with very light skin tones. Okay. Other examples from the Greek world. Uh -huh. Atalante, a... Um, uh, a um, um, Herein, uh, represented in, uh, I think that's the boar hunt. And then a dance of uh, men and women dancing. All, again, women in uh, very light colored, men uh, in black. And in uh, other painting also, Daedalus and Pazifae in very dark colors. Uh, with uh, Perseus and Andromeda. But then we have this one here, uh, with uh, Achilles uh, at Skiros being uh, discovered uh, hi hi hiding among women. So a woman here in very light skin tones, Odysseus uh, as with very dark skin, and then uh, Achilles uh, painted as if he was a woman. Uh, well, color uh, can both reveal the, uh, the, 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 the skin of the woman and hide, uh, in the case here of Achilles. Uh, it's uh, atypical. Now, then, on a different register, 
I forgot to check the time. Uh, I may have only about five or six minutes. Now, Georges Dumézil uh, had built his entire career on studying the social hierarchy of the Indo-Europeans. And he connected that uh, to different uh, colors. Okay, So, white, which he considered the color of light, purity, and the sacred, which in India he uh, as associated with the Brahmin. Red, which is blood, strength, and warlike, which is associated with the Kshatriya, the warriors, the warrior class. And dark blue or black, which was associated with soil and prosperity, which is the Vaisya, and the Vaisya are the, uh, well, everybody else, huh? the, um, uh, the craftsmen, the uh, farmers, uh, all the productive people. Okay? Now, some have criticized him uh, by saying that this is just too simple, it doesn't match the, uh, doesn't match the, uh, the social structure of India, and also it's uh, racist because it implies that uh, white is also the color of the skin of people and things of that nature. But there are um, remnants of this that can be uh, uh, recognized in certain uh, situations. And here this is a quote from a man, H. Moser, who visited uh, the area of, in Uzbek today's Uzbekistan and he says this, on important occasions, the men wore a turban of white linen for the mullahs or the priests, of blue wool or cotton for the merchants, and red for the warriors. And so we have the three colors here. Okay? And of course, I told you I would come back to these colors. Huh? And of course, there's no connection. There's no direct, uh, direct connection. Now, I'm moving to, uh, well, one of my last uh, uh, subjects, and that is uh, the use of colors uh, to, um, uh, to indicate power. We've already seen uh, over uh, several different texts uh, the idea that the color purple is, uh, was reserved for um, royalty. Um, no problem there. Uh, but this, the, the, this toga is in purple here is the one that is reserved in the Roman Republic, at any rate, for uh, the uh, general in his uh, triumph. But I want to uh, uh, talk more about the Toga Candida. Now, the Toga Candida is uh, a bright white uh, toga uh, that is specially uh, cleaned uh, for uh, the um, for the, um, um, uh, the, the person who runs for office. Uh -huh. So white in the Indo-European scheme, and even today, uh, is considered as the color of purity, the color of light. Now, let me be cynical a little bit here. Uh, and uh, given what we know of uh, the behavior of uh, Roman politicians, and I'm not going to mention politicians of any other uh, state. Uh, given what we know of the, uh, the, the venality and the avarice of um, Roman uh, politicians, uh, the, uh, the, the, the use of a, a white uh, toga certainly is meant to hide something, uh, to hide the venality of the person to uh, hide the fact that uh, this uh, person is in it uh, in order to enrich himself, as we know from so many uh, governors of uh, provinces that have, uh, that have um, uh, plundered uh, their provinces of resources. And so we get the word candidate uh, from this, uh, uh, from the uh, idea of purity and it is not okay now uh, my last slide is simply an illustration that uh, color uh, also uh, permeates every um, every um, um, activity in life huh? and these i finish with a 
um, an image that is appropriate for Turkey since it is from Constantinople and the um, the colors of the um, the teams in uh, the Hippodrome uh, teams uh, whose colors are very often associated with politics okay I was tempted to uh, to change the uh, the jerseys here to those of I don't know Galatasaray and um, uh, uh, Besiktas and uh, and the like anyway so uh, color has meaning meaning changes and uh, it's uh, something that is universal and is associated with uh, the is, is begins with um, with uh, with what with us as humans okay thank you I am done here I am going to stop share